behalf of group 2 so the paper is uh, crisp, uh, crisp, which is critical slice prefetching. I will uh, go through each of these points throughout the presentation. So firstly, we uh, begin with uh, the context. So uh, we all know that uh, memory access is very costly and we have come up with techniques like uh, cache pre the cache hierarchies, L1, L2, L LLC caches. So these are the latencies shown here. So four cycles, 10 cycles, 30 cycles. So we are uh, prefetching the uh, data so that we every instruction does not need to see the high DRAM latency, which can be hundreds of cycles. So cache management techniques can reduce the number of misses by prefetching the data in these uh, cache hierarchy. So we have uh, discussed various uh, uh, approaches for this. So now, uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the cache misses, the cache misses are still inevitable. So, uh, typical uh, in the benchmark uh, spec CPU, uh, the highest number of misses can go as high as 27%. So, uh, the LLC misses are still uh, inevitable, and the DRAM latency, the high DRAM latency, does show up. So. All these techniques we have uh, discussed here aim at reducing the latency. So these are latency avoiding uh, techniques. But uh, at the end of the day, there can still be misses and we are not able to fully uh, reduce these down to zero. So uh, the next step uh, to deal with this is we hide the latency. So uh, we say that, OK, so there the high DRAM latency is going to exist. So what can we do about it? So the next step is that we can hide it. So when we say hide, uh, so naturally the question arises is that hide the latency where? So uh, we hide the latency behind other in instructions. So what we mean by this is basically we prioritize memory accesses. So uh, suppose uh, we have a 10th instruction as the memory access, some load, and uh, the 11th instruction needs that data. And if it is a miss, then uh, the whole pipeline will get stalled because I have to wait for hundreds of cycles to get that uh, uh, data which instruction 11 needs. But now if we prioritize the memory access as the first instruction, so these uh, one to nine instructions can uh, execute uh, in the meanwhile. And the by the time the 11th instruction is reached, we can have the data ready uh, by prioritizing the memory access. So we uh, get the uh, approach of uh, why we need to prioritize memory accesses over other instructions. So suppose we have a memory access now, some memory access. So when we need to prioritize this, uh, we need to give it some address. So to execute a load instruction, it needs an address. So that address uh, in this case is uh, given by the sum of R3 and R4. So in independently prioritizing only this instruction is not going to work because R3 and R4 uh, still need the correct values for this load to execute correctly. So uh, this uh, 3 and R4 needs to be computed first. So suppose the preceding instructions somewhere in R3 and R4 are uh, getting calculated. So these, these instructions are termed as the address generating instructions. So these uh, R3 and R4 combined together generate the address for this, this particular load. So these are termed as the address generating instructions and together with the uh, load, load instruction, this is together called as the load slice. So this slice uh, concept is, uh, this is the slice we are talking about. So slice is basically the address generating instructions combined with the load. So this is a set of uh, collection of instructions, which we call as a load slice. Now, uh, so intuitively it is clear that uh, we, we can see that this R3 is this here, so we can, uh, make out which AG uh, the address generating instructions are there, but in hardware, how do we find the, these instructions? So these instructions are uh, so this this approach is proposed was first proposed in the load slice score. Um, so Australian, sorry for interrupting. Can you just use the but, pointer? Okay. Oh. How do we do it in teams uh, in the slides? Is there a. Oh. Uh, near the slideshow, you have okay. the option at the top right. Uh, 
Okay, otherwise continuous. Okay, continue. I think it's not there in the slide. Okay, the continue. Thing. Yeah, I can download it on just a minute. So. You can just use your mouse and continue because sometimes. Yes. Yeah, is it visible now? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yes, so we, we need to find these uh, address generating instructions first. And uh, uh, this approach was first presented in the load slice code. So this is this was proposed back in 2015. So they propose an iterative backward dependency analysis technique to find these address generating instructions uh, directly in the hardware itself. So before that, uh, what was done is that the compiler or the programmer had to manually tag these as the address generating instructions for this load and uh, then do further processing, but this iterative backward dependency analysis approach uh, does that automatically in the hardware. So this is a hardware only technique to find the slices. So uh, let us take a look at how it works. So this basically we can uh, intuitively see these later the dependencies. So how it is implemented in the hardware is as follows. So we maintain a register dependency table, which is a uh, which is which maps every physical register to the latest instruction that writes to it. So in this case, uh, we have register R3, which is written to by this instruction R I2. So we have this uh, entry here. This is corresponding. This will be there for every physical register. And then uh, in addition to this, we are maintaining a uh, instruction slice table. So I will come to that in a minute. So this. Uh, what we're doing is for for any load, if we have a load, so we need to iterate backwards and find uh, the producers of this registers which are consumed in this load. So in this case, we have R3 and R4. So uh, whenever we have a load instruction, I will see that which which are the source registers for this load instruction. So in this case, it is R3 and R4. I'll go and look up this R3 in the register dependency table, and then I will see that this source of this is uh, the producer of this R3 is actually I2. So this I2. I2 is then uh, fed into the I2 is then inserted into the instruction slice table. So similarly for uh, uh, similarly for I uh, similarly for I3, this I3 is then inserted into the uh, instruction slice table. So for every load, this this process is carried out, and we are populating this uh, register dependency table and instruction slice table. So now this is uh, we are uh, an another uh, precision instruction for example so this r0 is written to by i1 then in the next iteration this i1 will be inserted into the instruction slice table so every every time this at every iteration we are uh, moving one step back and finding the whole dependency for this particular load and then we are putting it into the ist this ist holds all the address generating instructions now now uh, okay, so can you go back to previous slide yeah this one so this IST is for a given load, right? No, no. This is this is a universal uh, uh, structure shared by all the loads. So this uh, every load. So this I4 is a load here, but uh, any other load will also use the same IST. So it's a global temporal order, is it? I think you got disconnected. Hey, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Siddharth, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yes. what, 
yeah what i was asking is so it's a global temporal order for all the loads yes yes it is a global uh, table so for all the loads yes Yes, so any any time I see a load, I will just uh, iterate over this table to find out. But but how exactly will I know that these are the instructions that are giving me the addresses, right? For for my load. Uh, yes. So so uh, we don't need to differentiate between loads. So I'll uh, come to this uh, just okay. so. Uh, this uh, huh. so we need to uh, as we discussed we need to prioritize the loads and for that we need to prioritize the whole AGIs as well. So prioritize the AGIs. So uh, what this load slice uh, core architecture has done is we uh, send these uh, address generating instructions and the load instructions to a separate prioritized queue. So this B queue is a uh, in order queue added, which is basically it takes it bypasses all the prioritized. Uh, uh, loads and the stores and the AGIs to a separate queue. So this BQ is given the priority. So in this case, uh, we don't really need to differentiate between the loads. So this, uh, whichever load it is, we need to send it to the BQ to uh, prioritize it. So we don't need to know that these particular instructions are responsible for this load. Uh, they can be anything. They We just need to know that they are responsible for some load at some point in time. Other than uh, bypass to the uh, address, the AGS and the loads and stores are bypassed to the BQ, and this is a given priority so that uh, by the time this uh, memory at latency, by the time the access is done, uh, the uh, by the time the store is done, uh, sorry, by the time the loading is done, the instructions which are going to use that load are, will have come to the head of the AQ. So that is the idea behind this. Uh, yes, so this this has some limitations. Hi, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yes. One question: yes. uh, Why do we need to prioritize stores? Also, I can understand why we need to prioritize loads, but stores will not have any dependencies, right? So stores, yeah, any memory access. So suppose we have a store, uh, we give it an address and we give it a value to store. So that store to reflect to the corresponding uh, memory will also. Uh, will also take the, some time and suppose we are then some subsequent instruction is reading from that same location that will get uh, stalled because it doesn't have the right value so any memory no, access it uh, it can just read from the store queue or whatever the queue the stores are maintaining right from that queue it can read back the value right because that value is available it doesn't have to go to the memory to read that value if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so in general, the uh, subsequent stores will. That value which is available there, it once we store that value, uh, suppose after some uh, 10 instructions, if we are reading it again, that value won't be there in the store cache so i mean uh, once once we issue the store the uh, effect to the for the effect to be reflected in the memory it will take some latency and it, within uh, in that time we don't have access to that uh, store value uh, suppose suppose we are you know, uh, okay 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 yeah, we, we could not hear you. What was the OK? Uh, he said this is in order core, so uh, he is not very sure that the, there will be some store queue and other other instructions will have access to that. Because right. this is in order, right? Yes, this is a simple. So this core focuses on energy efficiency and it does not have the uh, other possible structures, which oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you should have mentioned that in the very first uh, slide. This uh, the purpose why we are doing this is uh, both A and A, AQ and BQ are uh, energy uh, in order queues. So even though loads are out of order with respect to the execute instruction, both these uh, queues are in order. So it does not have the uh, ROB overhead uh, uh, in terms of energy. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, so this this I basically uh, outlined here just to introduce the concept of slices and uh, because we will be needing it in the uh, subsequent discussion. Yes. Uh, and the iterative backward dependency analysis is the main uh, focus here. So this further paper, it will uh, to understand the results. We will need this the understanding of how it works here. Uh, yes, so this uh, the limitations of now this is these are the limitations of the iterative backward dependency analysis. So while comparing uh, uh, whenever we are comparing now this uh, limitations are of the this. So from this paper, we are only taking this concept of iterative backward dependency analysis. So uh, the rest of the things are very different. So only this uh, the factors are taken from there. So one of the limitations of this is this this hardware only approach is that uh, uh, if we have a load here and the there is a dependency through memory. So basically, uh, in I three we are reading the address, uh, we are reading the uh, location stored in R zero, and uh, we are getting the load. But this this dependency won't be this dependency won't be. This dependency won't be shown by the uh, by our IBDA because because of the registered dependency is not present here. So in the RDT, we are maintaining only register to physical instructions. So this this type of dependencies are not uh, visible in the uh, in this approach. Hey, can you go slow? I think I missed it. Yeah, in huh. this case, uh, why you won't be able to track it? Huh. So here basically uh, we have a store we are storing the uh, value of R4 in the uh, memory location of R0, this R0 location. And then we are in the subsequent instruction again, reading this uh, same memory location. Uh, and then uh, this load is happening. So what is in the uh, iterative backward dependency analysis, we were uh, taking registers, uh, register, uh, so the dependency will uh, provide me that uh, R three is coming from I three, right? Dependency, yes, yes. So that is all it provides. So this we don't know that now. This this memory location is not known to the uh, uh, the uh, RDT and the IST. So basically, uh, whenever we have a load followed by a store followed by a load, this. Uh, the backward analysis won't pass through that. Yeah, got it, got it. So because this R zero is there, we we can't find a corresponding the corresponding instruction there, uh, because this read is happening not from the register but from the memory location pointed by the register. Yes. Uh, so the numbering is messed up in the PCT after downloading. Okay. Uh, this uh, so now we need to store the uh, uh, we need to store this register dependency table and the instruction slice table. Uh, so this will require uh, some storage space on the chip itself, which will need to be updated uh, in every cycle uh, uh, while updating the while filling up the IST and the RDT. And then finally, detailed information. I will come to this point later. So this will. This was the overall uh, approach for yes, hardware. Don't, don't, don't change slides so frequently. It, it uh, becomes hard to focus. Yes, Either yes. go forward or go backward. Uh, don't, don't change it frequently. Yes. Uh, so, so far we uh, covered this iterative backward dependency analysis, the hardware based uh, approach to find the instruction slices and prioritize them. So now Another approach uh, which is uh, so these are the latency tolerating approaches. So basically the latency will still be there hundreds of cycles, but it will be hidden behind the uh, parallel other instructions which are going on in the meantime. Uh, so this behavior is also possible in the simple out of order core wherever. So basically wherever we have a stall, the other uh, instructions which are ready behind in the ROB can go ahead and execute that. So this uh, behavior is also possible in a simple baseline out of order code. So, but here, uh, one of the observations which this uh, the authors of this paper have made is that uh, so this is a simple linked list traversal, and we have a we are tra traversing between the nodes, and this is a uh, vector multiplied by a scalar in the in the inside loop. 
so what they have obs observed is that whenever we have a uh, the current out of order processors uh, so this this internal uh, instructions can go in parallel because uh, separate vector the separate elements are there's no dependency between the uh, loop iterations but once we are done executing this if there is a miss here if there is a miss in the current uh, this this part the whole next uh, iteration will get stalled because this next iteration current will still not have the correct value so what they have observed is that uh, so the out of order cores per se won't prioritize this instruction so uh, what we need is that if there is a stall, if there is a miss here, this is more uh, way more costly than this because this can potentially go on in uh, parallel. So what they have observed is that this uh, because this, these instructions are older in the uh, they have come before, so the out of order core will still prioritize these instructions over this. So in the end, this if there is a miss here, it will stall the pipeline. So the current out of order cores will not be able to. Uh, it has no basis to prioritize this instruction over this load. So both of these are loads because it is getting the value here. So this this is the observation, the novel observation made by the authors of this paper. So based on this observation and the previous uh, hardware only uh, implementation, they propose the crisp. So crisp is basically critical slice prefetching. So they introduce a software based solution <coughs> for <coughs> obtaining the slices uh, so these are the various steps so basically i'll uh, go through so what they are proposing is that earlier we were uh, uh, detecting the slices in the hardware itself and we had the limitations as i discussed earlier now what we will do is we, we will first uh, make a dry run uh, uh, we will first make a dry run of the program so in this run, we will simply trace out the instruction, generate a trace uh, for the instruction which are executed. From that, we will uh, have an idea of, uh, we will have the idea of various misses and the uh, exact what uh, order the instructions were executed and what happened in the, uh, while executing the program. So we will now analyze that generated trace to determine uh, critical loads. So critical loads are defined as follows. So uh, these are similar to uh, earlier we were prioritizing all loads, but they observed that uh, prioritizing all loads is not necessary and we, we can only prioritize the critical loads for uh, increased performance. So this, this is the basis for uh, determining critical loads. So intuitively it, uh, it is that it makes sense that if a particular load is missing the LHC very often, then uh, we mark it as a critical load. Also, if it is uh, a high percentage of the loads, all loads that are executed, then it is it plays a significant part and hence we uh, uh, call it critical. And also if the prefetcher fails to predict the prefetch the address, then uh, we call it critical and less average MLP means that at that particular instant when the critical the, that particular load is executed, uh, if we have no other scope for uh, other if we have no scope for other issuing other loads, then that means that we have less MLP. So which means that this load should uh, should be given priority because otherwise the uh, it will stall the pipeline. So these. <coughs> In the uh, trace, these values are obtained using this performance monitoring units uh, and the processor trace. So these are Intel uh, features in the processor. So these are used to obtain these uh, the trace and the miss ratio, the miss latency, and all those uh, required values. Now, uh, in the instruction miss, we can have uh, some some instruction uh, some benchmarks have. A very high percentage of loads and some have very uh, negligible loads so what we need to do is based on the instruction miss and the base ipc uh, this value these these numbers are linearly scaled so basically if you have too many loads we will uh, adjust these values to account for that instruction mix as well now uh, one important implication of this is that for every every program we have a different instruction mix and a different uh, different trace so this uh, critical loads which we are marking for every 
program are going to be application specific. So for different programs, we will have different set of critical loads. And uh, what they have observed is that the highest performance improvement is observed using this approach if we have 5 to 40 percent of critical instructions. So basically, uh, we must have non-critical instructions to deprioritize. Otherwise, if every instruction is marked as critical, then it uh, doesn't make a difference. So we need to have some uh, non-critical instructions which we can deprioritize. Hey, so now, uh, yes. How many more slides you have? Yes, I'll, yes. I'm, I'm coming to the end. OK, OK, get it done maybe in five minutes. Yes, yes. Uh, so. So we have detected the critical loads. Uh, we basically need to find the corresponding uh, load slices. Uh, so this is the algorithm for that. So this is just simple. Uh, this is C, C like uh, not related to hardware cell for this. Uh, so we basically, we just same concept which we were following there. We are now following in the software. So now uh, the implication of this is that uh, uh, this is the same example as earlier. So this uh, earlier we were not able to prioritize this instruction in the baseline out of order, but now this will be marked as a critical load and uh, this can be then prioritized before this vector uh, multiplication can take place. So this is the earlier problem we are solving here. Uh, so we can uh, extend the same idea for branch. So if the bar branch predictor fails, we can have a there will be performance hit. So Similarly, what we had done for loads, we do for branches. So basically, uh, whatever determines the branch outcome, we prioritize that slice the load. Uh, so how we implement uh, reflect this in the hardware is as follows. So uh, we add a prefix to every instruction which says that this uh, instruction is critical. Uh, so this. Uh, the software, this is just the. Uh, implementation of what I just said. So we are basically give the uh, base base binary to it, then it will generate that trace and then uh, find the instructions, the critical instructions and the slices, and then uh, add the instruction prefix and generate the updated binary. So this hardware implementation, uh, we are adding this priority tag, which stores that I need to prioritize this instruction. And if multiple tags have priority one, um, if multiple instructions are prioritized uh, critical, then it we are taking the oldest instruction first while scheduling. So the IPC improvements uh, over the baseline are reported here. So as you can see, the average uh, improvement is uh, about 8.4 percent, and maximum improvement in some benchmarks can go around 35 to uh, 40 percent. Uh, then branch slicing, uh, so having only load slices does increase performance, but having branch slices uh, increases, they stack on top of each other and uh, the overall performance is uh, higher than when we take each individually. Now this, the variation with uh, sensitivity to ROB size, so this basically over the baseline ROB, uh, for a smaller ROB size, if the baseline uh, ROB size is small, we notice uh, we get a higher uh, percentage performance gain. So basically, if the baseline ROB is high itself, then it is that ROB itself, the baseline out of order core itself is able to uh, resolve the problems and then the percentage gains are lesser. So as you can see this orange, the for smaller ROB, the percentage gains are higher. Now, uh, the earlier the threshold which we saw, uh, they, we had to scale it uh, and based on the instruction mix, mix they, the value, exact value will change. But on an average, they observed that the uh, miss threshold of 1% gives the best results, but the optimum will be workload dependent because of the difference in instruction mix. Now, uh, this analysis shows that how many instructions are tagged as critical. So basically, this, this will correspond to the size of the IST in our original uh, IBDA implementation. So as we can see here, uh, many more than thousand, almost tens of thousands of uh, instructions can get critical and th storing these in the hardware in our IST is uh, introduces a large overhead. So this this is also advantage of this approach. 
and uh, so uh, code footprint so static code footprint is basically we are adding a single byte so this uh, in the static case we are not uh, seeing much difference but in the dynamic case uh, because we are in the extra byte will appear multiple times the uh, overhead is around 5.2 percent so on an average so this is a negative side that the code footprint increases by 5.2 percent on an average so the in con to conclude the presentation so uh, so the advantage main advantage of this approach is basically the flexibility because for every different uh, program or application we are having a different uh, the dynamic uh, tagging of the critical slices so this flexibility over hardware based approaches and the uh, extra hardware we are adding is negligible so we are basically just attaching a single byte to the uh, instruction uh, prefix as the instruction prefix so the additional hardware incurred is negligible yes thank you yes are there any question yes yeah, questions. Yeah, hi, uh, I have this heard now. Of, uh, whenever you uh, run, let's say, an application is run 10 times uh, in a particular duration, so every time this dynamic footprint will be added to it, or uh, when you're running oh, yes. it, or how it is? So, this we are running it a uh, single time. So, this basically uh, in their implementation, uh, they are running the application once and then obtaining the footprint and then they are doing the analysis. So this, of course, has the underlying assumption that uh, a particular instruction will be uh, repeated in a loop and uh, we get a sufficient uh, uh, high number of uh, data points to conclude the uh, numbers. So this miss ratio and the uh, percentage of executed loads. So they are running it only once, yes. Oh, okay, so in the case, like let's say I run an application now, so I mean it will be stored somewhere in the application itself. It is added. Yes, yes, yes. So this uh, binary. Uh, so once we run it, uh, once once the profiling is done, we will use that updated binary every time we want to uh, run okay. this. Yes. Okay. Uh, so let's say I have this uh, system uh, in which I am related to this only. Let's say I have a bi binary which I compiled up and uh, ran on this particular system. Yes. So that particular binary, uh, so my binary, let's say it is, uh, is being replaced by it or it is a separate binary because let's say I want to put, uh, transform a binary from this system to any other system. So this added bytes might uh, cause yes, problem yes, in that case, right? Yes, it is. It is a problem. Yes. So basically, once this updated binary is uh, generated, so uh, this is specific to this crisp enabled uh, hardware only. So if we take this somewhere else, uh, it won't. The instruction prefix won't make sense. So yeah, won't uh, work there. Yes. So it is uh, in fact a limitation of like software only, like mm -hmm. uh, this hybrid approach. Yes. If we have a hardware only, then no matter what we run on it, it should uh, give consistent. It should be consistent, but here we need to have a crisp enabled hardware as well as the uh, corresponding software. OK, maybe in the interest of time, uh, let's move on. It was a good presentation. Overall, it was really good. Yes, so just one last uh, for this. Oh, you have something. Oh, OK, you should have put it. Uh, yes, no, I, I was waiting for uh, questions. Also. Yes, so. Uh, so now uh, one of the natural questions is that we are profiling it at some random time. So in that case, if if there is some noise like other processes, background processes running. So the LLC misses in that case will be different, right? Because uh, the other process no, is Siddharth, I think for all this kind of work, uh, the assumption is you should run it in isolation. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, there, there is no point doing uh, memory related uh, yeah, you yes. know, measurements. Yes. Yes. So, so my name is Shreyan. Uh, Siddharth is my father's name. OK, I, I get confused. Sorry. Yes. yes. So the order is uh, different. Yes. So. 
Nice. So again, uh, this they compare with the IBDA and uh, uh, they criticize the IBDA that it does not uh, give the it does not find the full load slices and uh, again that the uh, storage becomes a problem. But in the original implementation, uh, when they had proposed the uh, IBDA approach, it was meant only to separate the AGIs and loads and stores from the execute instructions. So this uh, IBDA approach was never meant to find the full backtrace because even if uh, even if this, uh, even if this this dependency is not uh, not observed here, we have this store which is anyway going to be go redirected to the uh, in order BQ. So at the in the end, uh, even if you are not able to find this dependency, our execution like the distribution of the A and BQ instructions is going to remain the same. So this approach was never meant to do that uh, so can we add some uh, parameter some uh, structure to the ist itself to do what they have uh, what crisp is proposing in the hardware itself okay, okay we can move on Who is the next speaker? Yeah, hi, sir. Presenter. Get started. Yeah, I'm trying to share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Tanu on behalf of Team ArcMates. Today I'll be presenting the paper CPP, Coordinated Management of Cache Partitioning, Market Partitioning, and Prefetch Throttling. So this is going to be the overall flow of the presentation. So with multi-core architectures and workload consolidation, we have multiple cores competing for shared memory resources like cache, that is in particular last level cache, and of chip memory bandwidth. This results in shared resource contention, which further impacts the memory access time, and it essentially uh, increases the amount of time that takes for any memory access. And we know that memory access time is critical for performance. So we need to reduce the memory access time by essentially trying to reduce share, uh, shared resource contention. So for this, some techniques have been proposed in the past. This includes firstly partitioning the shared resource itself among the applications. So first is cache partitioning. Cache partitioning. Uh, another technique that was proposed was to partition the bandwidth. And another was prefetch throttling. By prefetch throttling, we mean that uh, deciding for each application whether the prefetches should be enabled or disabled. So, other uh, so there have been some more works uh, to tackle this problem, and those works essentially try to combine the three techniques that we just saw: cache partitioning, bandwidth partitioning, and prefetch throttling. So they try to use two techniques at a time, and they establish that yes, we can get more performance improvements by managing two at a time. So. A uh, natural question to ask here is, is using two techniques enough? So here is a simple example. Here is a simple example to illustrate. Uh, so say we have two applications, A and B. A benefits from a higher bandwidth and requires prefetching for a better performance, whereas B, another application, benefits from a larger cache size and requires prefetcher to be disabled. So we can clearly see that if any technique manages only two at two resources at a time, there is no way it can reach the optimal configuration. We need to uh, consider all the three 
in tandem. To establish this further, the authors of the paper performed experiments on SPEC CPU 2006 uh, benchmarks, and uh, they used some 640 workloads, each consisting of four applications, to see uh, if there is potential of improvement with by using three uh, techniques together. So we can see that. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you go to the previous slide, slide seven? Yes. Uh, if you said A requires large bandwidth and it requires pre fetching, then how do you conclude that it requires a small cap? So, so it is not. Uh, okay. yeah, I actually want to exactly know what you, what you want to drive, point that you want to drive from this slide. I was not able to get Okay, to okay, okay. I'll. I'll uh, okay. Hey, what so, was the question? I could not hear it properly. Yeah, am I audible now, Biswa? Yeah, better, bit better. Yeah. So I wanted to know that she talked about two applications A and B, wherein she said for application A, it requires large bandwidth and it requires prefetching. And I and then she has also written that it requires small cache. Then I wasn't particularly able to understand how she could conclude that it requires a small cache, and what is the point that she was trying to drive from this slide. Okay. Yeah, the question is clear. Thanks. Uh, okay. So the thing is, when I said that it is sensitive, uh, like it requires higher bandwidth or requires prefitting. So when I'm, uh, since I I made an implicit uh, assumption or say the there is an implicit assumption here that it is not sensitive to cache at all. So for it, cache uh, being smaller or larger doesn't make much difference, as compared to B, where a larger cache can significantly improve performance. Tanu, can you give me an example of an application that, that can be a proxy for this A? So in the paper they do have sir, uh, a workload. No, no, yeah, of... no, no, no need to mention a specific workload. You can just think about it, right? Uh, in terms of memory access patterns or characteristics. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So yeah, simply if it doesn't have any cache locality, like locality, it doesn't need a cache thrashing or maybe. Like okay, if we are streaming data, for example. Okay. Okay, that's why uh, the cache size doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, got it. Mm. Yeah. So, so since it is not sensitive to cache, and the other one requires a larger cache, so the optimal configuration would be to give A a smaller cache and B a larger cache. So, and similarly for bandwidth. So, does it yeah. answer the, the question? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was clear. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so we will see. Uh, yeah, so the authors uh, conducted experiments for this, and they saw that yes, indeed, there is some potential for improvement if we uh, used three techniques together, and the amount of uh, the number or say the fraction of workloads which benefit by uh, from coordinating three te uh, techniques at a time is more than uh, the number of workloads that can be covered by using two techniques. By covered, I mean that. Uh, for which performance can be improved. Okay, so now since we have established that by using three techniques, we can have more performance gains. So next up is how to get these gains. So the they propose CPP, which essentially consists of three cache resource con uh, three controllers, which is, uh, is someone saying something. No, I think, okay. yeah, continue. Yeah. So it consists of three controllers which make decisions for each resource. Here, resources are cache, bandwidth, and we can say the decisions about prefetching as well. So, and it further consists of a coordination mechanism which uh, provides an opportunity for these controllers to coordinate with each other. We will look at these one by one. So first one is cache resource controller. So it is basically concerned with allocating cache to different applications. And it does it by partitioning the cache uh, in a way-based manner. It uses look-ahead algorithm for determining the partition sizes. So the crux of the algorithm is that the algorithm essentially picks an application that uh, so uh, essentially, we are uh, our main mo motive was to reduce the memory access latency, and this algorithm focuses on reducing the 
uh, cache misses, aggregate cache misses for a workload. A workload can have multiple applications. So it tries to reduce the aggregate misses. So it picks an application that can cause maximum reduction, but at the same time, it consumes with a least number of ways. So it assigns ways to the application so picked and then repeats the process. Next is bandwidth resource controller. So as the name suggests, it partitions the bandwidth among the applications and the main input, or we can say the main thing that it uses for distributing the bandwidth is the queuing delay experienced by the applications. Here queuing delay is simply the uh, memory access latency, total memory access latency. So an application with a higher ex uh, memory access latency is allocated a higher bandwidth. Then prefetch throttling controller. So it makes decisions regarding if prefetches should be enabled or disabled for any particular application. So to do this, what uh, it does is it samples IPC with both setting, uh, both the settings. So for some interval, it keeps the prefetcher on, looks at the IPC, then it turns off the uh, prefetcher, looks at the IPC, and then sees which uh, configuration gave it maximum IPC uh, performance gains, and then continues with that. So, so far we have seen these three individual controllers. Now there, uh, we say that we need to coordinate. Uh, we need to allow for coordination between these mechanisms. Hey, Tanu, I have a question. Yes, sir. So why you need uh, coordination? Is there a negative interaction between all these three techniques? Uh, they don't talk about any like in general negative interaction. They say that yeah, the decisions of one controller can impact another controller's decision. Like say if we have. Uh, okay, wait. Is it, is it, can you repeat your question once? Yeah. yeah, the question is, you know, uh, let's say there are three different controllers. They are trying to improve the average memory access latency of a given workload. Right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. is, is there a possibility that the decisions taken by one control, uh, one controller is actually, uh, you know, it is actually affecting the decisions taken by the other controllers. Uh, yes, sir, it does. Like, I have an ex like. Are you talking about these kind of interactions, or uh, or am I not getting your question? Yeah, so, I'm talking about interactions only. So where where you know, let, let's say all of them when they work in isolation, they believe that they are doing the best for the system, but eventually they are actually. Uh, screwing up the system because they okay. are not coordinated, right? Okay, okay. Let, let me think of an example if I can. So, like, it may so happen that uh, the same application benefits from all the three, like, uh, individually. Yeah, yeah, that, that is possible. Uh, but but it may also happen that, uh, let's say you are providing more cache space, but uh, may, maybe the Prefetcher is doing not that well, right? I don't know. I am not able to find out. Uh, huh, go on. Yes, sir, there can be a case wherein an application uh, which is provided less cache space, right? When you, because you are doing cache partitioning. You want to avoid uh, prefetch pollution as much as possible for that application. Just giving an example. Yeah, yeah. Sort yes. of a negative interaction that is possible that you would like to avoid for that particular application. Maybe a uh, combined coordinated approach might help you avoid that situation. Yeah, yeah. got it. Was, yeah. Was similar cases like when we have prefetches and if we have inaccurate prefetches. So for bandwidth, like for yeah. with inaccurate prefetches, we may want a higher bandwidth. So that. Got it. Got it. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah, I think this is almost covered with our discussion that uh, cache allocation. Uh, so here they are just establishing that what all kind of interactions should we uh, keep in mind or should we uh, we should consider. So uh, first they say that uh, what all things can impact bandwidth allocation. So with prefetch throttling, as I just said, that with inaccurate prefetches, we may need a higher bandwidth allocation. So we need to take care of prefetched decision while allocating bandwidth. And similarly, when we have a 
uh, when we have a larger cash so we may uh, we may go for a, a, a what we say a lower bandwidth and vice versa so now we look at the what are, what all things can impact prefetch throttling so similarly if we have a very high a uh, very high bandwidth then um, so essentially bandwidth has the potential to impact ipc and prefetch throttler makes decision based on ipc so it can uh, impact the decision taken by prefetch throttler these cases are similar so here one thing that uh, we should notice that they disallow uh, cash allocation being affected by bandwidth allocation the on the pretext that we want to avoid misses uh, as much as we can rather than have misses but uh, with a like but those that can be tackled with a lower latency on that pretext they disallow bandwidth affecting cash so putting it all together uh, how they do uh, this allocation so they start with an initial cash and bandwidth allocation for each application so initial uh, allocation is essentially by partitioning the cash equally amongst all the applications and similarly bandwidth then they sample uh, uh, they sample ipc with prefetching on and then with prefetching off and then make a decision to enable or disable based on performance gains then after an interval which they refer to as a reconfiguration interval they again update the cash allocation based on previous prefetch decision and similarly bandwidth allocation is updated but this time it involves both the decisions taken by prefetch as well as the cash here if we see the cash allocation was only influenced by prefetch decision not by the bandwidth decision so this process repeats so this is a dynamic process and this keeps on going T tanu i have a question yes sir so this approach makes sense if all the intervals or sub intervals that you have been talking about uh, assumes that the application behavior remains the same across 0 1 2 3 4 uh 0 1 2 3 4 uh i think like up till this it it uh, does assume that the application behavior re remains the same but after this it is again making the decision okay 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 Let, let's say the first half itself but the, there is a possibility that uh, the application can change its uh, behavior right there might yes, be a phase change yes sir Yes, so how, how will they handle? They don't handle that. Even they don't handle the case where, say, the application itself changes on the core. So they don't. Okay, th th that's a different uh, data point altogether if you are changing from one core to another. Mm -hmm. But within a core, it's a valid argument, right? Let's say if your application has linked list traversal and then array, mm -hmm. and you are actually monitoring the linked list traversal, suddenly by the end of this interval, you are jumping into the array. Right, sir. Then the entire decision process yes. is uh, wrong, right? Yes, sir. Like, yeah, that makes sense. They try to, they do a sensitivity analysis of what this size should be, but yeah, they don't but specify. It, it will vary. It will vary from uh, application to application, and uh, more specifically, uh, in terms of workload, it will vary even further, right? Yes, sir. It makes sense, but they don't have any provision to alter it dynamically or anything of that sort. They have a fixed value for the configuration interval. I have one other question. So th this entire process is per core or for the entire system? So the uh, as in so uh, the when when we are allocating, yes. So we take all the cores into consideration. No, 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 no. So that means you are uh, throttling all the cores in one go. No, the uh, prefix throttling uh, that is for per, like per core, uh -huh. but the allocation we look at the queuing delays for each core or the application on each core. 
so the previous throttling is application uh, per That's application right. so it, it can be different for two applications okay. four and yeah okay but then uh, you know uh, j j just a uh, empirical uh, uh, argument so if you have a 64 core system you need such 64 intervals before you enter into the optimal configuration right uh, so, uh, can't we within a single interval evaluate for each core in parallel or oh. is it because like we are, we don't need to take any inter application interaction or anything we are just like like any any application is simply running on the core we need to record the ipc at that point just we need to alter the prefix setting oh, yeah, i can't uh, uh, okay i'll repeat once uh, so say we have some applications running on each core now we in the first say this interval we turn on the prefetcher and record the ipc that we get over this okay interval. so so you oh, are so. saying that you you are saying that uh, the controllers they actually track of the inter application interaction by definition itself is that correct because your, your goal is to minimize the average memory access time for the workload so they, they take it uh, as a workload uh, or is it like the thing is the prefetching is application specific but the cache and bandwidth are workload like they take into consideration the whole workload but prefetching is application specific yeah but what my question is see, see let's say i have a two core system yes sir you have done your cache partitioning. Let's say you have given half of the ways to core zero, rest of the ways to core one. Right. For that particular cache allocation, you are, you are checking what is happening with prefetch throttling, right? Yes. But you are checking prefetch throttling of both the applications now. What if, uh, you know, for one application, there is no need of prefetch throttling? So that's taken care of by uh, both of these different IPCs, and then we make our decision based on these IPC values, right? So that, that's what I was asking. So by default, the IPC of the workload is giving you the global picture. Is that right? So, no, it is per app, uh, uh, like per application. Yeah, yeah, per application you are taking the IPC, but finally, if you take a metric of throughput or something, you can just sum it up, right? And that will right. give you a global picture. Right. But yes, but like the thing is, the prefetch decision is based on application and not the global data. Yeah, even that, cache and bandwidth are located specific to the application. But but they take into consideration the, the like because we are taking queuing delay, so and yeah. we divide it proportionately based. So okay, maybe in the interest of time, move on. Okay. Okay. So. This implementation has some overheads associated with this. The first one is that since we are doing cache partitioning and the partitions may change dynamically, so we may need to invalidate some of the addresses. And if the application in the after some time tries to access the same address, it may actually end up experiencing a miss. And uh, another overhead is that since we are sampling, so if any application is sensitive to prefetching and say if it for example it benefits from prefetching so for the time that we are sampling it with prefetch disabled it may be detrimental for performance so let's look at the evaluation and this is a configuration being used that is llc is 5112 kb and it is 16 cores so they use cmp and then the prefetcher and the memory controls. These are things of interest. So uh, they performed their evaluation on spec CPU 2006 benchmark. They used 14 workloads, each consisting of 16 applications. And uh, this is the, uh, the y-axis shows the normalized weighted speed up. So what is normalized weighted speed up? So every workload will consist of multiple applications so the speed up of each application 
is averaged that gives you the normalized weighted speed up and we can see that uh, cbp uh, improves over base uh, so the baseline here is uh, no partitioning of cache no partitioning of bandwidth and prefetch is disabled so that is the baseline so over baseline it improves over 50% and the state of art was cache plus prefetch that is two techniques together so over that it uh, performs uh, it performs better by 11% so tanu the prefetchers are actually at the l2 or both l1 l2 uh, uh, l1 l we are talking about llc llc they don't have prefetchers l2. so i think uh, i don't think they mentioned l1 anywhere in the paper okay, okay. Uh, so so just the l2 prefetchers okay yeah, it must be that. Yes. yeah the previous slide mentions that was it yeah 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 <laughs> i missed that okay so next is uh, next they do some uh, experiments to see what's the fair fairness so uh, here on the y axis there is average normalized turnaround time so the turnaround time is essentially the cpi cycles per instruction and normalized with respect to the baseline baseline again is same as in the previous case and average is because we take uh, the average of all the applications in a workload so here we uh, so it is lower the be better so lower the average normalized turnaround time the better it is so cvp it turns out to be 27% more fair than baseline and 4% more fair than the state of the art that was cache plus prefetch then they uh, for a part particular workload they just try to reinforce the idea that there are some applications for which cache plus prefetch performs better some applications for which bandwidth plus cache performs better but at the end of the day it is their uh, solution that is cbp which per, uh, performs better for majority of the applications so to conclude we saw that performance uh, in terms of memory access latency is important and we had three aspects cache bandwidth and prefetching three problems one solution that is cbp and it provides 11% improvement over state of the art so these are the points that maybe we can discuss if we have time otherwise we are open to questions thank you go go back to previous slide the points for discussion why you need impact of bandwidth on cache uh as in like uh, they just simply disregarded that so maybe uh, like i was just thinking that if we can try considering that interaction as well and see if it actually makes sense to disregard that or discard that yeah with a sliced last level cache you won't find any impact oh, okay okay mostly based on my limited experience uh, because uh, the bandwidth will be in hundreds of uh, gbs uh, but if you kind of you know uh, average it out across slices it will be still really high okay okay uh, there might be some corner cases here and there but in general it's not a problem okay okay Hey, I I can't hear you again, Barun. Yeah, why should we account for context switching? Yeah, it was similar to the case like uh, which um, specified that if while you like before you reach the next reconfiguration interval, if there is some context switching happening over here, so you will have some other application, right? And it will continue to use the parameters that were tuned for the previous application. Uh, i think there is a general assumption here that while context switching we more or less reset the things or you bring the processor state to the next context that we have saved and we reset all these structures i personally believe there is this inherent assumption i'm not reset sure. reset these structures meaning what uh, all these counters and everything that helps you to take a decision in regards to whether we ah, need to okay 
So, but yeah. in that but, case, note that the reconfiguration interval is 10 millisecond, which is of the order of the context switching time. So essentially, you are if you are resetting everything, then there is no reconfiguration happening. You are again starting afresh. No, context switch will be in microseconds, certainly not in milliseconds. So microsecond is like, you know, few thousands, more than 10,000 cycles kind of from processor point of view. Yeah. OK. No, so context switching is more frequent, right? Uh, this is more frequent. No, it's not that frequent. <laughs> <laughs> If you look at Linux uh, uh, kernel and then, then uh, monitor context switch, you won't find it that frequent. It, yeah, it will be frequent if you run, you know, let's say K, run, K number of applications where K is greater than the number of lo logical cores. Then it will be frequent. Right, right. Sorry. Okay. So if I'm running 32 applications on 16 core machine, then it will be frequent. But here okay. they are running 16 applications on 16 core, right? Yeah, actually 14 on 16. Yes, yes. Yeah, so sense. it's kind of uh, more, more or less it will be in the stable state. Okay, okay. Uh, Tanu, I have a question. Yeah. So I, I do not understand why uh, prefetch throttling and bandwidth are not considered as one or um, Maybe in, in one slide you mentioned that uh, some application may get benefit from uh, prefetch throttling plus cache size and the other one may get uh, benefit from the bandwidth, uh, more bandwidth allocation plus cache size. But uh, prefetch throttling will choke up the queues, right? And then eventually a, an application which is, which is allowed more prefetch throttling need to have more bandwidth allocation as well. This is what I am assuming. Can you? Oh, Yasika, throttling yes, meaning you are throttling it down. You are. You are you oh, know, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, throttling it am down. Am I right? Your... Tanu, am I right? You no. can set it both ways. The example ways. we discussed was uh, where prefetch was enabled with high bandwidth and prefetch was disabled, but with large cache size. Um, Okay. Yeah, so Yasika, it's not like, uh, you know, uh, if this goes, this goes up, then even prefetcher goes up. It's not like that. Um, okay, so, that's so might... throttling can be, you know, in both the direction. You can actually make it conservative or you can make it aggressive. Okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, I, I also have one more clarification question. Tanu, uh, the, what exactly is meant by the uh, bandwidth, new bandwidth allocation? Does it mean that you will... Uh, prioritize some of the entries at the DRAM no, level? No, no, no. Uh, like initially, we had some initial configuration to start with. It was just equally partitioning the bandwidth. So yeah. after after reconfiguration interval, we again make decisions for bandwidth partition, like using how, the how queuing delays. The question is how? Us using queuing delays. For yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. So so it's like that you are preferring some of the application, some of the uh, request in the queue. Let's say for application A, you are saying that we'll allocate more bandwidth to this application, which so it means that in the DRAM read queue, write queue uh, queues, you will prefer a request of th that application over other applications. I, I, I'm asking uh, this, you, is this. Yeah, you can say that, but it is because it was already in a state where it was uh, like at a disadvantage because it had a higher queuing delay. So you can, it had a higher queuing delay. That is why we allocated more bandwidth to, to it and that is why it will be preferred now because already it was suffering from delays. Okay, okay. So yeah, so then then uh, my previous question was if you will be preferring one of the application by adding up uh, queuing delays to other application and if you're not uh, increasing the prefetch request for the same application, how will that work uh, in coherence with each other? I mean, I did not understand that it was brief. Yeah, yeah, please. It was some application. It is not necessary that pre if it needs a higher bandwidth, it also needs prefetching. It may be the case it doesn't need prefetching at all. It doesn't uh, like. It yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, it might be a very um, 
very extreme uh, uh, corner case, I would say. But um, my my point is that application A needs high bandwidth and B is given uh, uh, this privilege for more uh, prefetch requests. So how will that be handled yeah. at the DRAM level? If you're saying that A needs higher bandwidth, you are saying, right? A needs yes. higher. But how are we saying that it needs higher bandwidth? Like, what is the basis of deciding that it needs higher bandwidth? When Okay, so them them. So it's a streaming on, application, let's say. Yeah, yeah. So it will demand more bandwidth, right? So, so can we not say with the queuing delays in this case as well? Yeah, yeah, you will be able to. I'm not yeah. saying no. Because it will because it yeah. uh, like you have number of memory accesses and. No, that so, I agree. Yeah, I agree with the example that that can happen. But I my question is, what if there are two different applications? One needs more bandwidth and other needs more prefetch requests. Okay, so, so I am of the opinion. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, is that uh, how how the, how do they handle it at the DRAM? That is only my question. Yeah. Okay, so I am of the opinion that uh, like if you need higher bandwidth, it will reflect in the queuing delay, which we will take care in the bandwidth controller. It will take care of allocating based on queuing delays. If you need a higher bandwidth, it should reflect in the queuing delays. So Yasika, the simple answer is you may need more prefetch requests, but as long as the average queue latency is low, it's, it's yeah. still good enough. You don't need additional bandwidth. Yeah, so the yeah. moment it goes up, then the controller will come up. The bandwidth controller will come up and it will start allocating more bandwidth to you, irrespective of prefetching or no prefetching. OK, OK. Yeah, so then in the next reconfiguration interval, that will be taken care of. Yep. Uh, OK, OK, thank you. OK, yeah. Any other questions? Okay then. Yeah, it was overall good. Both the presentations were good today. So cool. Thank you, sir. I'll stop yeah, so there was one more presentation that was scheduled today. That will happen on 17th. Uh, it was by Prajit. So he is having fever and all. So he will present on uh, 17th. So Virendra, can you stop recording? Okay, sir.